ahead, Adriana. Okay, thanks, Jenny. Um, thank you, everyone who is joining us this afternoon, uh, and also an especial thank you to uh, many sponsors who have helped our working group, U.S. CLIVAR, NSF Paleo Climate Program, uh, NSF Marine Geology and Geophysics, and also the NOAA Climate Program Office. Uh, and we also have some sponsors for an upcoming workshop that we're doing, including NASA and DOE. So I thought I would start by giving you uh, a brief sense of what our, walking, water, our working group on water isotopes is all about, and then dive into some of our recent accomplishments, and also talk about the ongoing activities that we have. So the purpose of our group is to think about how we can apply water isotopes to address questions about climate variability and climate change. And that sort of begs a couple of questions, which is why water isotopes, uh, which in turn brings up this question of what is a water isotope. So when we think about water isotopes, what we're principally interested in are the ratios of deuterium to hydrogen and then oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 in molecules of water. And that can be water vapor, clouds, rain, oceans, ice sheets, plant leaves, or really any other water reservoir in the Earth system. These ratios of the heavy to light hydrogen or heavy to light oxygen, the reason they're so useful is that they're good tracers of water cycle processes. And so as an example of that, if we think about water evaporating, say, from a body, a body of water like the ocean, it is the isotopically lighter water molecules that preferentially evaporate and enter the atmosphere. In contrast, when air masses cool and condense, it is the isotopically heavy water that preferentially forms clouds and ultimately rains out. And how much or how effectively heavy water is removed from the atmosphere depends on the efficiency of precipitation. So what I mean by that is how much of this cloud water actually turns into rain and precipitates to the ground and also on the microphysical pathways of precipitation formation, which has to do with temperature and supersaturation and other factors. So what this means is that air masses that exchange moisture with different water reservoirs, like the ocean or vegetation or lakes or even snow and ice, or air masses that undergo different condensation histories in the atmosphere, they look isotopically distinct. And that is why water isotopes give us this really powerful way to track moisture naturally as it moves through the atmosphere. Some of this atmospheric signal gets transferred into and then preserved in these different paleoclimate archives, things like corals and ice cores and tree rings, speleothems, and also lake sediments is another one not on this uh, chart. Because moisture transport is tightly tied to the overall climate state, the water isotope ratios that are preserved in, this, in these paleo archives give us important insight into what climate looked like in the past. So our, our working group is interested in leveraging all of this diverse information recorded in water isotope ratios to really address and answer some of the critical knowledge gaps that we have in terms of climate science and understanding climate variability and change today. I also want to give you one, I think, more concrete example to help make this a little more tangible about how we're thinking about using water isotopes to address key questions in climate science right now. And so that example has to do with climate sensitivity. Right now, um, we continue to have very high uncertainty in our estimates of climate sensitivity, which is kind of an estimate of how much our planet will warm in response to greenhouse gas forcing. In at least several of our climate models today, one of the parameters that seems to have a very big effect on climate sensitivity is what we call rain re-evaporation, basically how much falling rain never makes it to the ground. It's a pretty hard thing to measure if you're trying to do it by collecting the mass of falling water in the atmosphere. However, if you only need to collect one rain droplet to get its isotopic composition, this becomes a much more possible problem to address. The reason has to do with what these two panels are showing. So what you're looking at here are the variations in isotope ratios of oxygen in, and hydrogen in falling precipitation versus the amount of precipitation that evaporates as it falls. And you can see that there's this very nearly linear scaling relationship, regardless of the rain droplet size, which is given by these different colors on the right. 
And so if we're able to come up with the right observational strategies, we could potentially use isotope ratios of water in precipitation to begin to answer and I guess narrow some of our uncertainties in estimates of climate sensitivity that are contributed by not having enough observational constraints on problems like rain re-evaporation. So it's these kinds of questions that our working group is really um, working to try to address. And our approach to doing so is through a combination of observations, modeling, and also thinking about data science, ways to um, keep and preserve the information from our observational and our modeling experiments. And our working group members are shown here on the right. The list of folks, um, both from the United States and other countries, shows a, a diverse kind of expertise in different disciplines. We come from different institutions, different countries, and there's a good mix of career level too. And so all together we are then working to support these um, integrated objectives. So I want to switch now to a couple of specific objectives that our working group is working on and tell you about some of our recent successes and also ongoing projects to try to address these objectives. So to try to synthesize water isotope research and also identify some of that research that's most critical to climate variability and change, we have two projects going on, or we, there are two projects that we've worked on most recently. One is that last fall we put together a fall seminar series to try to talk about advances and opportunities in model development, observational networks, data repositories, and then also data assimilation techniques and synthesis techniques. And that fall seminar series was one of the ways that we identified an issue like rain re-evaporation as being a particularly key opportunity for water isotopes to help us improve our understanding of the climate system and improve our estimates of climate sensitivity. Some other really nice, uh, I guess, findings from this fall seminar series were that we talked a lot about how model development and the incorporation of water isotopes as tracers and simulations is allowing us to do more direct comparisons between simulations and then our paleoclimate archives. Uh, and similarly, there's been a lot of work recently through data simulation techniques to try to develop reanalysis products um, that are based on incorporating water isotoping and other types of paleoproxy information. One of the key needs that came out of this fall seminar series was realizing that a big challenge for any of these efforts shown here on this slide is that we simply need more isotopic data. And so one way that we tried to address that was by looking for some areas or some opportunities for very immediate or short-term integration into ongoing, underway um, climate monitoring networks. And so here's an example of that. The Tropical Pacific Observing System, or TPOS, just put out its second report making recommendations about strategies for ongoing climate monitoring in the tropical Pacific. And as a, as a working group, we were able to contribute information to that report, so now it specifically calls out the needs for water isotopic sampling of ocean water and also of water vapor and precipitation at island stations to study things like, as listed here, heat and moisture fluxes, ocean and atmosphere mixing, detecting changes in tropical climate, and then also more generally extending our record and our understanding of tropical Pacific climate. And there are some other opportunities as well, which, David, would you uh, jump in and mention uh, Eureka and Atomica and also Mosaic? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Adriana. Um, yeah, I guess as, as a whole, the working group has um, sort of a two-pronged strategy thinking about observations. The, the TPOS 2020 uh, is a good example of uh, a long-term observing uh, strategy that gets it climate variability on that, that type of scale. The other approach is process-oriented work that's really um, more aligned with uh, dedicated field campaigns and uh, two high-profile campaigns that are coming up uh, uh, are uh, ones where the working group is involved in helping coordinate isotopic contributions uh, and then particularly for the, uh, the NOAA atomic um, crews and, and aircraft deployment coming up uh, that parallels with the European Eureka effort has a uh, subgroup called ISO Eureka, uh, which uh, the working group's involved in. It represents a, a partnership between uh, US scientists and uh, international partners 
to develop a coordinated strategy that parallels non-isotopic measurements. So that includes uh, seawater samples, precipitation samples, aircraft measurements from uh, at least one, if not three platforms, uh, aircraft platforms. Um, and so that sort of holistic approach allows us to integrate the isotopic measurements with uh, other types of measurements that are being done as part of those campaigns. Um, that particular study for Eureka is uh, um, going to be based uh, near Barbados, uh, looking at um, uh, trade cumulus and, and uh, convective organization cold calls, uh, which is really at the heart of a number of the key um, isotopic processes related to rain evaporation and ultimately climate sensitivity as a downstream component. Uh, another uh, campaign which is underway, also another high profile campaign, is Mosaic in the Arctic uh, that's now uh, getting well and truly underway now. Um, uh, the, um, the Awi ship uh, is locked in the sea ice and it's going to drift with the ice over this winter to look at the relationship between uh, the ocean surface, sea ice, uh, and the atmosphere above uh, in a very multifaceted way. And again, through um, both partnerships within the US and internationally, there's an isotopic component that's going to be paralleling um, that effort. Uh, and again, there's uh, measurements of water vapor uh, and precipitation, snow, sea ice, uh, and uh, ocean water as well. Um, the key to both of those is there is this holistic integration with the underlying campaigns where it's not a, a, a small add-on in a way, it's really integrated with um, the science goals of those underlying campaigns. Um, and uh, we're hoping that the working group has a long-term outcome of being able to uh, uh, continue that sort of support of um, and promotion of those sorts of um, activities alongside these large uh, international uh, uh, experiments. Thanks, Adriana. Yeah, thank you. So back to our, our list of specific objectives, some of the things we're working on right now are setting out those goals for um, climate model development and observational networks, and then also plan for integrated observational and modeling experiments. And then finally, some sort of a data repository or archive where we can actually put and store the, the information that's generated from those integrated experiments. And we have a couple projects that are um, going on right now uh, and coming up in the near future that are, are really helping us address these. So the first one I wanted to mention is that we have an upcoming workshop on water isotopes and climate that we'll be holding in Boulder in October. Uh, and very excited to say that as of now, uh, we closed abstract submission Friday, and as of now we have more than 80 abstracts, and we expect uh, something closer to about 100 participants in total. To talk about some of the um, needs for modeling and observations and data archives, we're going to organize this workshop around four main science themes which are listed here. Land air exchange, ocean air coupling, moisture dynamics, and also climate sensitivity. And, uh, and as some examples within those of questions that we anticipate talking about are things like, um, for example, how does, what is the role of moisture recycling over land areas in moistening the atmosphere and helping generate convection? How do large-scale modes of climate variability influence water linkages and, and influence some of our long-term warming trends? Uh, what are processes that generate convection and control storm intensity? And then how do cloud feedbacks and precipitation processes influence our estimates of climate sensitivity? One thing that I'm excited about about this workshop, which is a little new for me, is that we've really made an effort to enable remote participation in the presentations, the plenary discussions, and the breakout sessions. Uh, and so it's really opened the door for a number of our international colleagues to participate from places like Norway and France and Japan. And it's also making the workshop, I think, more accessible for early career researchers while helping cut down on some of our collective carbon footprint. The second project that we have going on to address our objectives around uh, new strategies is an AGU fall meeting town hall, um, which we will be holding really to engage a broader community of the, the, the whole geoscience community to talk about these opportunities for applying water isotope tracers to questions of climate variability and change. Uh, and I will let David jump in if there are any more details as of now on the, the town hall, but I will say that we just did find out about its, um, that it's going forward, and so most of our schedule and timing of this and agenda will, will be set out in the next month or two. Yeah, I can mention just a couple of things there, Adriana. I guess um, one of the, the challenges that um, in some ways helped motivate the formation of this group at the outset was the need for um, access to the right sort of tools. That's both data tools, meaning data sets themselves, as well as 
uh, the right sort of modeling tools and modeling there sort of broadly cast to mean ways of synthesizing the observations for hypothesis testing and, and, and so on. So one of the goals of the town hall is to start to engage the wider community um, to figure out where we should be setting our uh, collective views to what sort of data systems and information systems would serve the community and actually in some ways getting a, a, a more holistic view of what is our community. I think the, the, the way in which the isotopic information is used throughout climate science is actually very broad uh, and making sure that we're, we're connecting with everybody uh, is an important goal. And meantime, some future steps that uh, we will be working towards are collecting the information that we've already put together from our fall seminar, seminar series into a synthesis type of paper. We also want to work a little more um, in a focused way on developing design needs for our data repository. And then we also want to make outreach videos on how water isotopes are used as tools to answer questions about the climate system. And those will be really geared for more of a general audience. So I think with that, I'm going to leave this slide up, which talks about some of my impressions about where water isotopes are particularly useful or effective for climate science questions, and open up the floor for any comments or questions, uh, perhaps uh, starting with my co-chairs, Kim and David, if there were any other pieces that they wanted to add to the discussion. Uh, I'm happy if Kim, you want to add something? Kim says she's good. Anything else? All right, I see a question from Samson, if we want to go to the audience now for questions. Sounds great. Thank you. All right, go ahead, Sam. Um, regarding the um, measurement of isotopes, is, uh, is it possible to do that for uh, water vapor and clouds, or do they have to have a, some kind of liquid state of water? That's my uh, first question. And my second question is, how is, uh, where are uh, the data sets of, of that kind? Uh, where do you... Uh, put them and uh, has there been publications that uh, one can look at? And the third one is um, if you have uh, been working with the convection community in general and convection and AC interaction community in general and uh, uh, how the proportions of the isotopes uh, relate to the actual uh, convection dynamics, has, have people been looking at those? Thank you for your questions. I hope I, I can answer them all and uh, let me know if I've, I've forgotten a piece of one. I'm going to start with your first one on um, the measurements and what's po uh, possible today. So we can definitely measure isotope ratios in water vapor and cloud condensate separately from, say, what falls as rain or is collected as, as snow or lake water, or river water, or ocean water. Uh, and there has been commercial off-the-shelf off kind of technology for that for about the last 10 years. Um, we actually have some community resources now even to facilitate that. For example, the National Ecological Observatory Network, NEON, has water vapor isotope, um, so isotope measurements in water vapor at all of their core sites on the land. And, okay. uh, and NCAR, where I am, also has um, a requestable instrument that flies as part of its airborne facility, which the NSF um, supports. Uh, in terms of data sets, I think that's part of the reason this working group exists, is um, what is a good way to archive the data that is being collected in a way that best allows us to make comparisons um, across space and time, right? To be able to do this sort of distributed sampling and distributed analyses or large-scale analyses. And, and a tricky part of that is coming up with the right way to archive data that has been collected uh, in different places at different times uh, uh, for different um, time integration periods and also maybe at this point still with different calibration approaches. So I think this working group is really formed at a time where we can help shape some of that uh, and, and sort of the future progress in thinking about how we collect our isotopic information for these bigger kinds of global questions. And then yeah. third, well, I guess you'd asked about publications in there. There, there are definitely some. <laughs> I'd be happy to send you um, some examples offline if that's yeah. possible or provide them to yeah. Jenny. 
And then lastly, you asked about sort of how are we working with the convection um, modeling community and also ERC community. And um, I think the the TPOS 2020 involvement is actually a really nice example of recent involvement with the ARC interaction community. Uh, there are also kind of these the broader efforts through things like some of our national um, climate model development centers um, that are incorporating water isotopic tracers, not just in the atmosphere, but also in the ocean, in the land surface, so that we can run these coupled simulations and think about those exchanges and what they mean for modern day processes and also for interpreting past climate. And then even on the convection permitting scale, uh, there have been, um, I guess, friends of the group, if not members of the group, actively mm -hmm. working on um, isotopic tracer use in um, WARF and also um, different large eddy simulations, and combining that with some of these airborne or other types of intense observational campaigns like David mentioned, the Eureka campaign, which will be looking specifically at um, cloud uh, and convective mixing and what effect oh, okay. that has on cloudiness. Those are some of, those are just examples of the ways we've been involved. So I think maybe where we are working to do a better job for the community as a whole is sort of telling that story, synthesizing that information, and then thinking about where are still the gaps? Where can we very clearly contribute that we're not? And that was why I had brought up that, that one example of rain re-evaporation. It seems yeah. like an obvious question that isotopes could help answer, and it's one that we haven't yet even um, that we haven't set up sort of a dedicated effort to try to understand. Thank you very much. Uh, please go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to add um, this is another dimension um, is that there are some uh, relatively comprehensive uh, satellite remote sensing data sets as well, which in some ways um, represent a different axis to the type of observing which is um, available. And again, as Adriana mentioned, that there is a need to synthesize that with other types of data sets. But I, I just wanted to mention that there is uh, quite good remote sensing support for measuring uh, isotope ratios in water vapor from space. Thank you. Okay. I completely forgot that. Thank you very much. So I will uh, I will uh, try to uh, reach out to you. I have some uh, uh, more questions, perhaps an opportunity for um, um, working together in uh, in future campa campaigns. I'm involved in um, DOE activities in ARM and. Uh, and so on, and I, I felt like this w piece was a missing uh, piece that uh, we could uh, potentially uh, look into opportunities for uh, working together. Thank you. Uh, Tony Lee has a question. So go ahead, Tony. Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have two questions, actually, if you don't mind. The first question it's about the remote sensing data set. What satellite are they from? Uh, give an example if you could. And uh, whether the satellite measurement is for the atmosphere or for the ocean surface. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. So, um, so as David mentioned, the satellite retrievals of isotope ratios in water are for water vapor. And so some of the satellites that have, there's actually a number, um, some of the ones that have um, seen a lot of publication are uh, TESS, which flies on Aura, or did fly on Aura until very recently, which is part of NASA. Um, mm -hmm. David, the, the newest development is now AIRS is being modified in terms of its processing algorithms to include isotope ratios. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's, that's correct. Actually, that, that's a uh, the algorithm is being published, but the data is not quite ready yet. That will uh, be a continuous record going back to um, the launch of Aqua, which was um, you know, it's about, uh, 2002, I think it was. There was an exciting sort of um, introductory or uh, paper showcasing that new potential data set in ACP um, with John Warden as the lead author. Uh, and then also the European satellite EASI uh, has made measurements that are very similar to TESS, the NASA instrument. They tend to be mid-tropospheric water vapor isotope ratios, but then there are some others that have done either more full column, like Skiamaki, and even higher in the atmosphere. So there's, there's actually there's a surprising number. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, the reason that I asked was uh, because somebody from TPOS was asking me for uh, isotope measurement of the ocean surface. So I actually talked to John Warden, uh, another 
uh, the new PI, test PI, uh, and mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't seem to be aware of ocean surface isotope. It's all for atmosphere, isn't it? It is, yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt there, Adriana. I guess the, the, there's some technical challenges, but the way most measurements are done in the atmosphere is through infrared spectroscopy. Um, the, the emission spectra or other techniques would have to be involved to do uh, the surface ocean cases. I think this is an area where there's a really nice uh, need for this um, sort of integrated approach that there are techniques, uh, obviously, to make measurements in the atmosphere from satellites. The infrared measurements are a good example. Um, uh, whereas something like uh, the TPOS 2020 investment in surface seawater measurements uh, sets up a really nice way to do comparisons between what can be measured from space in perhaps the marine boundary layer isotope ratios versus what's at the surface. Um, but at the moment, uh, there's, there's been no technique to do remote sensing of the surface, which, you know, to be honest, I, I, I personally think that would be, a, 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 uh, I'm not sure it's a holy grail, but it would be a great data set to have in that the isotope ratio of seawater uh, broadly reflects the balance of precipitation minus evaporation in a similar way to salinity. Um, so you get a, a really nice constraint on the freshwater budget of the global ocean were, were, were a technique available. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, can, can I just chime in sure. there a bit? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I've been making measurements of seawater oxygen isotopes for uh, many years, many years, five years or so, and so we do those discreetly. Um, but you would make a salinity measurement um, off of any particular platform. And so that's just a small four milliliter vial and, uh, and an at same analyzer that you would use for water vapor or rainfall isotopes. And so that was really where we were trying to go with the TPOS um, uh, approach is to try to, wherever they're worried about discrete collections of seawater for analysis, to include a bottle for auction isotopes because of its uh, value add for, as, as another variable of, of mixing in, in water processes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So actually, uh, I have a second question. It's related to the constraint on models uh, in the context of data simulation. So this uh, isotopic data simulation, what model do they use? Is it a, the, do the models have the isotopic variables as well as the physical variables such as temperature, salinity, and velocity so that the isotopic measurement can be used to constrain the physical state variable, such as temperature salinity. Yes. Okay. So a couple. Yes, and so couple typically, models. right, okay. and typically um, you, you would have isotopic tracers in, in any sorts of um, phases that the water is in. So the water in vapor form uh, at various levels of the atmosphere, the, the, mm -hmm. the isotope ratios of the condensate, whether it's liquid or ice, and so on and so forth. Okay. Interesting. I guess I, one, one good. One good I was just going to mention one, one particular good example of that, that sort of using isotopes in a data, assimilation frame, data assimilation framework, I think in some ways is, um, I, I think we're now past the bleeding edge, but it's still very newly done. There's two good examples I think of here. One, uh, Kei Yoshimura, who's one of um, our working group members, uh, has been in um, Tokyo now for several years. When he was at, at Scripps, he worked with the, the NOAA uh, GFS model and put isotope traces into GFS and has been doing assimilation of satellite uh, uh, estimates of isotope ratios as, as within the GFS system. Uh, he's, he's found actually some remarkably encouraging results that if you only assimilate isotope ratios, uh, you don't assimilate temperature, you don't assimilate winds, you actually end up with really quite nice forecasts. So it's really quite an astonishing result in a lot of ways. Um, so that works continually going forwards. Uh, uh, another example that's uh, on a slightly longer time scale um, has been uh, a data uh, assimilation uh, process uh, uh, project, uh, the last millennium reanalysis, uh, which is delivered to NOAA now, a uh, 1,000 year long um, uh, assimilation. And part of that work was to utilize the isotope ratios um, as a constraint. Uh, this is using paleoclimate information uh, to constrain um, the, the climate system in a similar way uh, to other reanalysis data uh, sets that NOAA has sponsored in the past. I see. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, since it's 4.30, I think we'll stop right there. Um, thank you to David, Adriana, and Kim for presenting today at our pre-summit webinar. Our next pre-summit webinar is scheduled for July 29th, which is a Monday, Monday, the upcoming Monday, and it's going to feature our U.S. AMOC science team. Um, we'll also be switching to a different um, 
software platform, so we're no longer using ReadyTalk as of that time. Um, and we'll temporarily use, uh, I believe it's Global Meet. So I will send out new instructions on how to join us on Monday. Um, so again, thank you all for joining us.